A vicious beating, racial slurs, but the prosecutor says it's not a hate crime. What are you hoping, if anything, that some good might come out of what happens to you? Just to get justice. We look at Washington's new hate crime law and just how far it goes. Plus, racism, politics, and policy. Racial issues were bubbling under the surface, more prominent and more polarizing than they had been before. Black Washington lawmakers, they are few but mighty. How they're making their mark on Olympia. The doors are opening for Black African Amer Americans to participate in legislation. This may surprise you, but Washington has the fourth most cases of hate crimes of any state in the country. Good evening. I'm Joyce Taylor, and welcome to Facing Race. Tonight, we start with the brutal beating of a Latino teenager in Skagit County. Was it a hate crime? We at Facing Race have uncovered exclusive video of this attack as it happened. Susanna Frame looks deeper into Washington's new hate crime law. This story includes graphic video and audio that may be upsetting to some viewers. You're watching and listening to 17-year-old Joel Salgado having a seizure from blows to the head. You think this is Take that His attacker continues to beat him, kicking him here in the lower back. The Screaming profanities, including repeatedly calling him the N-word. The is this? Doing, bro? Huh? Eventually, Joel goes unconscious, but the assault continues wow. with a slap across the bro. face. I said, What happened, you? Huh? And while he lies there lifelessly, police records show the accused, 19 year old Trevor McCabe, doesn't call 911. Instead, he splashes water on Joel from the dog bowl in the video and ridicules him over what police say he's planning to steal. Yo, nice phone, don't mind if I smash it, homie. Nice phone, dog. Nice money, bro. Nice wallet, homie. Nice chains, dog. What's up? Yo, are they my new shoes, too? Did I just give me a new pair of uh, new pair of vans, bro? Joel begins to come to, according to court documents, unable to speak or stand. What happened, bro? What happened, bro? And underneath his redacted face, police say Trevor McCabe has used a Sharpie to scrawl a homophobic slur across his forehead. Say something, Say something, Police say McCabe didn't just record the vicious attack. He sent his videos out on social media via Snapchat to his friends in real time, including this final video where he allegedly points a loaded shotgun at Joel's car in the distance. Somehow he managed to stumble into it after the beating. When you got to pull a gun on a you got your house, bro. Medics helicoptered Joel to Harborview. According to records, he'd suffered life-threatening injuries, significant skull fractures, and internal bleeding. He couldn't talk or breathe on his own. The Harborview team said the outcome, quote, did not look good. ¿Qué piensas de lo que pasó a su hijo? This is Joel's mom, Rocio Linares of Burlington. I asked her in Spanish how she was processing what had happened to her son. Es doloroso. It is so painful, so painful to see your son like that in bed. It's something that I wouldn't wish on any mother, let alone a child. Afterward, he didn't even know or remember that I was his mother. It was difficult. After two major brain surgeries and weeks in the hospital, Joel survived. He didn't want to be on camera for safety reasons, as the defendant is out on bail. I don't really remember anything. Joel doesn't remember anything about the crime or the months leading up to it. But police pieced the night together, saying the two boys were acquaintances at school. Trevor McCabe allegedly lured Joel to his home that night in March, promising to sell him alcohol with a premeditated plan to beat him up. Can you even believe that all that happened to you? No. It just happened out of nowhere. I just really can't believe it happened to me. Skagit County prosecutors charged McCabe with two counts of assault, 
robbery and tampering with a witness with a plan to seek an extraordinary sentence because of McCabe's deliberate cruelty to the victim and egregious lack of remorse. We had the Skagit County Courthouse down here in Mount Vernon. Justice for Joel. Joel was beaten so bad and the county attorney right here at this building says it wasn't a hate crime. But those charges weren't good enough for many in the community. Several protests were held over the summer. That's Joel in the helmet with his family in June. We just want justice. That's all we want. We just want justice. This was a hate crime and it should be charged as a hate crime. The advocates say prosecutors need to add a hate crime because of the racial slurs spewed at Joel and dehumanizing writing across his forehead. Yes, it is uh, troubling to me that the prosecutor did not uh, charge the attacker with a hate crime. Last year, Representative Javier Valdez of Seattle sponsored the state's first ever hate crime bill. Now in the state of Washington, a person is guilty of a hate crime if the offense was motivated by religion, sexual orientation, or race. He pushed for it after hearing Washington stands out as a place where hate crimes are on the rise. According to data from the Department of Justice, Washington had more reported hate crimes in 2018 than nearly every other state. At 506, only California, New Jersey, and New York reported more crimes motivated by hate. It's alarming. Um, you know, that's not the state uh, where, you know, I, I was born and raised in, and so it was time to take some action on it. Records show Skagit County did look into adding a hate crime charge, but in the end, the prosecutor said they couldn't prove that was the motivation for the assault. The FBI came in and agreed with that decision. Investigative records obtained by King 5 show police found it was anger and jealousy over a girl, not race, that led to the beating. And we reached out to the prosecutor. Nina Martinez is board chair of the Latino Civic Alliance, one of three advocacy groups who say when they reached out to the prosecutor for answers, they didn't hear back. It sounds like you're just saying basic communication. Entering into dialogue would have meant so much to you in the community. Yes, it would have meant a great deal because that would have proven that that the community matters, that they respect the community. This is real dialogue that needs to happen and a real appreciation for different cultures in the community. And it has to be done. That's the only way it's going to build trust. This spring, Joel Salgado graduated from high school. He's relearned to talk, walk, and read, but still struggles with constant pain, balance, and cognition. There's lots of healing needed, and his family says that will get easier if somehow they find justice. Y la comunidad está enojada. The community is angry. I am very appreciative for their support, their prayers, and their protests. But I have to see the situation from the eyes of the mother of the victim. The only thing I want is justice for my child. He is my only son, and he is everything to me. Susanna Frame joins us tonight. Susanna, this video is just horrifying. In all your years of investigative reporting, have you ever seen anything like this? Absolutely not. I have never seen anything so callous and such a disregard for human life and a human being, a young one at that, than what we see in this video. That's not to say, of course, these horrible things don't happen, but how unusual is it that video was taken of the act while it was happening and then shared out on social media and we were able to obtain it. So I think it really gives a window into just how horrific a crime can be. So, Susanna, if what we've seen on this tape isn't a hate crime, what would it take to rise to that level? You know, motivation is the key and what prosecutors think they can prove. And they have a tough job. Motivation is one of the hardest things in law enforcement to prove. So it is possible to have racial slurs being spewed out during the commission of a crime, but that not be the motivation that they can prove. In this case, for example, if the attacker would have been saying to this Hispanic young man, go back to Mexico, I hate immigrants, you know, we don't need you in this country. That would have been a much easier, I'm assuming, correlation between what the attacker's perception of this young man's race is and why he might have been committing the crime at the time. Is there anything happening in our state to enhance our hate crime laws? This upcoming session, we're definitely going to be keeping our eye on it. 
when that hate crime bill was passed last year, they knew there was more work to do. So this year what they want to do is put in statute what they want police, schools, and yes, prosecutors to do when determining if they have a hate crime on their hands. For example, mandating that they need to bring in an expert perhaps to look it over, make sure the right questions were asked. And let me tell you, the Latino community, the people of color up in the Skagit County who came out and protested, that's exactly what they wanna see happening. Susanna, thank you. Washington's hate crime law is just one example of social justice issues driving higher voter turnout. So who are the people making the laws in our country and in our state? Last year, this photograph went viral. The current U.S. Congress became the most racially and ethnically diverse in history. Despite the progress, whites are still overrepresented. They make up 61% of the U.S. population, but 78% of voting members in Congress. In Washington state, state Congress members of color are few and far between. 72% of state legislators are white, which is close to the white population across the state of 70%. One of the largest differences, 12% of the state population is Hispanic, but Hispanic lawmakers only make up 3% of the state Congress. Blacks make up nearly 4% of the state population, but only fill 2% of the seats in the state capitol. The deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor generated a lot of outrage and talk of reform, but is it all just talk? Governor Jay Inslee says that he wants to pass laws to help the black community, but how realistic is that in a state with zero black senators? Five members of the House of Representatives who are black tell Drew Mickelson, change is coming. <laughs> I'm taking the loose hair at its roots and retwisting it back into the locks. Daniela Lewis takes pride in her work. People formerly call them dreadlocks, but I call them locks. Because I don't see our hair as dreadful, it's just locked. <laughs> the staff at Lakewood's Miss Beautiful Me says traditionally black hairstyles like locks, braids, and afros are making a comeback. And how we wear our hair? It's our crown. You gotta be able to wear your crown however you want to. But it hasn't always been that way. I was asked to wear my hair more professionally when I wore it in an afro one day. Whether it comes from a boss or a high school coach, shown here forcing a wrestler to cut his locks, preventing someone from having their hair in its natural state is now illegal in Washington. Those hairstyles are protected just like race and religion. We are the fifth state to ban this type of discrimination, and I want to thank Representative Morgan for a way to help people feel free in their own identity. I am proud to vote yes. Why? Because black hair is beautiful. Melanie Morgan sponsored the bill. And I, Melanie Morgan, will not tolerate any discrimination in our state of Washington. House Bill 2602 is declared passed. The bill passed overwhelmingly with bipartisan support. But Representative Morgan says originally some fellow Democrats told her to hold off. Actually, they told me no. And it was extremely hurtful. And matter of fact, I cried. Representative Morgan did not take no for an answer. She fought and prevailed and said the hair discrimination issue was just one of many that likely would not come to light if people of color we're not represented at the legislature. Because I have the actual experience. It is not textbook. This is my life. I am a black woman who's been alive for 52 years encountering issues, whether it be subtle or whether it be in my face. And is this the first time we've had a black house caucus? Are you, are, am I looking at the first? Well, we had one. It was, it was, it was a member of one and then it was a member of two. Member of one. <laughs> and then, uh, but now we're up to five. The speaker has opened the roll call machine. Of the 98 Washington state representatives, five House members are black. Representatives Morgan, Eric Pettigrew, Deborah Entenman, Jesse Johnson, and John Lovick. You're celebrating the fact that today there are five members, but we, we need more, right? I mean, a five is not enough. We need more and we will, we will get more. Clerk, take the record, please. Representative Lovick was first elected in 1998. At the time, the only black House member, until Eric Pettigrew was elected in 2002. One of Pettigrew's earliest Olympia interactions involved the N-word. There was a, a senior senator 
uh, who made a comment in the course of a negotiations uh, saying, you know, oh, uh, whoever the person is, you're just being an in in the woodpile. And, uh, and that really that bothered me, one. And then when I took it back to my own caucus and talked to them about it, the response was like, uh, you know, well, he's going to die off anyway, so don't worry about it. There are members of our legislature that have thought that they have been doing what is right for African-American people and people of color without asking us what we need and what we thought is important. So now we are speaking for ourselves. Representative Entenman chairs the Black Caucus, a subgroup of lawmakers. She hopes this caucus will grow. And as we know, there's strength in numbers, um, so it definitely counts to have people on the same page in terms of uh, what we want to get done. At 30, Representative Jesse Johnson is the youngest state legislator. He's seen his generation call for reform and thinks those voices will reach Olympia. Whereas before, I think we've lived in this diversity, equity, and inclusion era where we try to dance around the issue without directly saying we need to do something about this in particular. And the black community is at the forefront of those conversations and we're centering black voices in the conversations, I think, for the first time I've seen in my own lifetime. We don't have a black Senate caucus because we don't have a black senator upsetting. It makes our work harder when we don't have representation on the other side. If we write bills for our community, we would like to have representation on the other side that understands why we're writing this piece of legislation and not having to um, over explain as we often do, which drains us a lot. There's no doubt that having all of you inside the room when it happens is the best way to, to, to bring about reform, correct? I mean, there's yes. nothing better than having that voice in there. Absolutely. Yeah. We're reaching out, we're reaching back to members in the community, uh, letting them see the great work that we're doing, letting them see that, you know, you can go out and run for office. Uh, you might lose, but if you don't run, you're not gonna win. In our state legislature, we have had allies, but now it is time for us to speak for ourselves and stand for ourselves. That's the only way things get done. You gotta stand up for yourself. Just like with the hair discrimination bill, back at the salon, Daniela Lewis hopes more issues important to her community will be heard in Olympia soon. That's why it's important to have different representations in our government and everything so that they can fight for everybody. While our lawmakers are slowly getting more diverse, national polling shows the divide between Democrats and Republicans is growing deeper and wider. Central Washington University political science professor Todd Schaefer talked to us about how politicians on both sides of the aisle are making the problem worse and what voters can do to turn that trend around. I want to start with voter turnout. We are seeing record early voting and a surge in black voting, too. How do you explain that? It seems like whenever you're in a, a bad time, turnout goes up. Um, people tend to vote when they're angry and or afraid, unfortunately. Um, if, if times were good, we probably wouldn't be seeing this. The partisan differences have been ramped up uh, in the different communities. Um, and I think also because of the pandemic and the current, you know, the crisis that we've gone through the last few months um, has reinforced to people uh, the importance of voting, but also these questions about um, voter fraud and uh, voter suppression and so on on both sides to some degree um, have made people want to get involved. How much of a factor do you think voter suppression is in driving uh, Hispanic, Latinx, uh, black voting right now, early voting? Of course, in, in some states like Georgia and, and I guess Texas, where they're limiting how many polling places are, are open, um, there's some of that. And of course, we have um, voter ID and, and ballot uh, regulations and so on. I mean, obviously, we saw record African-American turnout when uh, Barack Obama ran uh, and so on. But I think this is a uh, similar situation in that people really in those communities value their vote. And so uh, they want to be counted. Fortunate here in Washington state that we uh, are in a state that 
makes it relatively easy to vote. Polling shows the partisan divide between Democrats and Republicans has grown in recent years. How does it compare now to other times in history? Are we more divided than ever? Well, we're certainly more divided than we were um, in the 1950s. Both sides now um, have essentially made it so that um, a key ingredient of people's partisan identity now uh, is sort of a, uh, a social identity. I almost equate it to a, a religion. I don't want to go that far, but, but a religious identity. Um, and people are choosing their party more now by what they don't like about the other side. Do you think that the divisive rhetoric does play a role? Uh, yes, I think that to some degree, um, people are uh, driven to be, um, I don't want to say necessarily hate the other side, but they, they don't uh, interact as much with other people. But essentially, people are, are becoming far more tribal, to use that term, politically. Um, and consequently, uh, they're listening to things that uh, make it sound more uh, ridiculous or more uh, extreme. Um, and this has also allowed, I think, people, certain political actors, not necessarily politicians, have chosen to use this to uh, kind of scare or, well, ratchet up people's emotional setting even more. What is some of the most divisive rhetoric you've heard from both sides this round? Yeah, Donald Trump is a polarizing figure. He has, in a sense, thrown gasoline on the grease fire as the of American politics has made it more extreme. Joe Biden, even as, as uh, relatively mild, I think he is in other ways. You know, what is his, one of his campaign slogans is, is about the soul of America. Um, so I think um, there's more of a notion that we're, our side is right and they're wrong. Um, not just that they disagree with us. And I think that's somewhat dangerous. How much of a factor do you think race and racism has been in this election? You know, Donald Trump argues he has condemned white supremacy, and I guess he has, due to uh, messaging from the Trump's administration, whether he intends to do this or not. He has clearly sent messages to um, white uh, nationalists or whatever you want to call them, um, that they have been felt emboldened by him and indeed uh, come sort of out of the woodwork. In a sense, um, I think racial uh, issues have were bubbling under the, the surface and have been uh, made more, more prominent and more polarizing than they had been before. Do you see a future where there will be an opportunity to close the political divide that right now seems to be getting wider? Um, I think that there is hope. Americans have been through this uh, before, but it's going to take people realizing that uh, they need to be a little more critical about themselves and about information and also uh, under trying to understand other points of view and other people who disagree with them. Um, and that's not easy to do when it's been made harder in the sense that we can all take the path of least resistance. But one of the problems right now is the incentives for politicians is not to compromise and make deals with the other side. Um, I hate to say that, but the way things are, particularly with partisan media, but also the way our districts are drawn and uh, other things, the way they raise money um, and so on, all goes to the people who are sort of the big hotheads and, and extremists. We look at history, America has been able to, um, like Lincoln said, you know, live up to the better angels in, of our nature. And I think if people come to the realization that this is not working for them, um, I think there can be a uh, compromise. After a quick break, our experts will answer your frequently awkward questions. We'll be right back. Now it's time for Frequently Awkward Questions, the part of our show where our experts answer questions that you may be too afraid or embarrassed to ask. And tonight's question comes from a viewer in Graham. 
What can white people do as individuals to apologize or to try to make amends to people of color? The answer from Dr. Ibram X. Kendi, author of How to Be an Anti-Racist. If there are individuals that you recognize that you've been racist towards and you would like to make amends and to apologize, you can just let them know. You, you should know that some of them may not want to hear your apology and, and some of them may, may really appreciate it. You shouldn't put any expectation on that. Um, but you should also be seeking to repair potentially any harm you brought. I think to black people in general, I think to black or brown or native communities, you should focus on supporting the organizations that are fighting for the rights and lives, you know, of these folks. Um, you know, that's the best way to really apologize. If you have a question for our experts and you want to see it on an upcoming episode of Facing Race, just text FAQ to 206-448-4545. Next week on Facing Race. It's contamination that you really can't see or smell. Sacred land spoiled. What do you think is the core issue here that allows something like this to happen? Uh, racism. The lasting impact on one area reservation. It's a deadly, toxic slime, and it's stuck on our people. The health effects hitting people of color hardest, and the fight for environmental justice. Thanks for joining us tonight and for sharing your stories. To watch this or any episode of our show, you can find it online at king5.com slash facing race. We do hope you'll join us again next week. And from all of us here, good night.